So following on from that amazing talk, I want to say uh, to talk to you a bit today about a project I've been working on called Socket Stream. Um, so first off, um, I'm Owen, and uh, it's great to be here today. And um, my project Socket Stream is basically a real-time framework for single-page apps, and it's built on Node.js. Some of you may have heard about this already. Um, it launched in 2011. And it has a pretty good following on GitHub, quite a lot of interested users, and quite a lot of apps which people are either working on or have put into production. It's gone through three major iterations during this time. And I think the thing I'm most happy about now is that um, after going through that, I'm pretty happy that we've got a number of ideas that work really well. So one of the problems I often get when I do these presentations, and one of the ones I want to address today is that I often, uh, somebody will see the presentation and say, hey, those ideas are really cool, but is it possible to just use one of these ideas in my own project without using the entire framework? So over the last few months, I've been doing a lot of thinking about how to make this possible. And it's really been, I've really been inspired by two, two things. Um, there's a talk by a guy called Rich Hickey, who's the guy who did Clojure, and it's called Simple Made Easy, and it's absolutely fantastic. And it's all about the fact that developers often reach for something that's easy, um, something that's near to hand, something that's, simple to, uh, something that's easy to get into, versus something that's simple to maintain for the long run. And in addition, um, a lot of you who, who do things in Node will know a guy called Substack, James Halliday, and he's written some amazing stuff um, about uh, really just about how to make big projects by making them small and putting together small units that do one thing well. So I, I was sort of doing a lot of uh, reading up about this over the last few months and really came to the conclusion that essentially when developers go into something for the first time, they essentially want two things out of it. At first, when you go into a project and you've never seen it before, you really want to get up and running instantly. That's a really big, important thing. And right at the start, you actually want somebody to tell you how to do this. You want somebody to say, I've got a CSS file. This is where you put it. Or this is how you do a model. Or you know, this, this is, um, if you want to do client-side code, this is how you should write it so it doesn't turn into one big spaghetti mess. And you want to be easy. Uh, you want it to be easy because you want it to be very productive early on. But later on, down the line, once for you're familiar with how to do things, you want to be able to make changes very quickly. And you want to be able to see something cool on the internet and think, well, if that looks really good. How do I put that into my stack? How can I change like the build system for something else? So really, what you crave after the initial euphoria is over, is not something that's easy. You're actually looking for something that's simple. So what's the solution to this? Well, I think it's twofold. I think, first of all, the first thing we need to do with SocketStream and in general with our apps is to split things up so that they do one thing well. Everything into little modules, one thing well. This is very much the sort of sub-stack ethic. Um, and uh, it's uh, having practiced this now over the last few months, I can, I can tap, vouch for the fact that it's a really good idea. It really makes you think hard about what this unit is doing and how it should talk to other ones. But doing this and doing it alone is no good if all we're doing is adding yet more modules onto NPM and nobody can find them and work out how to integrate them. So I think the second part of this is that there also needs to be a really good, beautifully integrated solution that says, these are all these little modules but this is how you wire them up to be instantly productive, uh, to make sure that you're doing it the right way and to make sure that you're really curating that tech stack and choosing the best, the best parts for each one. So in summary, we want something that's easy to be up, get up and running with and yet simple to change. Now, if this is the plan for SocketStream, this is not the first time this has been done. It's worth mentioning that, mentioning that there's a framework out there already called Flatiron which is by the Node Jitsu guys. Um, and this idea is very much um, explored here by making sure that you've got one framework which is actually made out of 
separate um, modules which are all standalone and usable on their own way. So having seen this and uh, wanting to sort of further develop this concept, in broad brushstrokes, that's exactly what you're going to be seeing from the next version of SocketStream, uh, which is SocketStream 04. So I've already made a good start on this. Um, and over the last few months, I've been pushing, so, you know, sort of going through the various parts of SocketStream, the various building blocks that make it up, and working out which parts of these I can uh, turn into little modules. And, you know, to give value not just to people who want to use the entire framework, but just want to use a subset of it. And today, because this is real-time comp, um, I want to focus on talking about the one part of this, real-time server. So, what is a real-time server? Well, in my, um, my sort of way of conceptualizing this, I see it really as a way of having something like uh, different clients, whether they be mobile clients or uh, desktop apps, coming to something like HA proxy, which you've just heard about, or uh, you know some sort of load balancer, um, and then talking to a WebSocket server, which in our case will be a node server. Um, and then, so the clients connect, and they're sending different messages over the wire. And what we're doing is we're processing those messages, doing something with it, and sending it back up through the WebSocket. And so, I've, so this has been going on in Socket, uh, Socket Stream for quite a while now. But it's always been entangled within the rest of the framework. And I'm really happy to say that um, for the first time now, we've just got a new module, uh, which I pushed to GitHub and NPM last night. And it's called Prism. And it's a fast, modular, real-time server that just does this one thing, nothing else. There's a GitHub URL. Um, you can have a look at it if you want. Don't do too much, because I'm going to tell you all about it in just a moment. Um, so let's have a look. So let's see what, it, uh, see what it does. OK, so it's a standalone server. This is the first thing. All it does is open a WebSocket connection and listen for incoming connections and processes the messages that come through it. It's not going to tell you where to put your CSS, and it's not going to do anything like that, or how to structure your client-side code, because that's the job of something that's higher up. In this case, it will be the SocketStream framework, which uses Prism. It has an integrated session store, um, where all the services that run on it, all the code that runs on it, has this concept of a session store, which is completely compatible with Express and Connect apps. And this is really important because everybody's writing Express and Connect apps, and they're also using things like Passport and EveryAuth to do um, things like Facebook Connect. But Facebook Connect is a HTTP auth, and that modifies the session that goes into Express. Well, what, what this allows by integrating this Connect session store into Prism is that you're able to use, take your code that runs on the Prism server and access the very same object, the very same session object, so you can can very easily see if a user is authenticated or not. It's been designed from the start with scaling in mind. Now, that's not to say that from day one you can just like go mad and uh, you know handle huge amounts of load on this. It's going to take some while to actually get there. But there's benchmarks in from the start, um, and everything has been thought out with the sort of two years I've had thinking about this stuff of how we can scale this up so that you can start multiple servers on the back end and scale out as you need. Um, in addition, there's a lot of work that's gone into minimizing the CPU, uh, the memory usage, and most importantly, the bandwidth that flows over the wire. This is really important, not just only for mobile connections, but also for bringing down those EC2 bills as well. It has a uh, Prism server comes with a client. A Prism, um, it's called Prism Client, which is also available in a separate repository on GitHub. And the cool thing about this is that the client runs everywhere that there's JavaScript. So if you want to connect from a, um, a browser, that's absolutely fine. But you can also connect from mobile browsers. And it's also been designed in a way where it should work perfectly fine with something like PhoneGap. The best part is you can also connect from a remote node process. So you, you can query the server through a remote REPL. Um, and it's all using the same client. It's all using the same tech stack. We had this idea in a previous version of SocketStream. 
Um, but that it sort of went through a different route. It was a different way of doing it, and that was it was a nice idea, but it wasn't correctly implemented. This is a much better way of doing it. Um, Prism also has the ability to inspect, modify, and drop messages as they come through the WebSocket. And this is really useful because it's so easy for malicious users on the internet to put um, a statement that calls a WebSocket and wrap that inside a while loop. And effectively, if your server is not prepared to, to deal with this, you, they basically go bring the server down because the web sockets are so fast that if you're on a high bandwidth connection, you can just go, you can blast that server off the internet basically. So um, Prism allows you to use um, middleware in exactly the same way that you already do with your Express apps. The concept's exactly the same. Now, tomorrow, um, I'm really looking forward to a, to a talk by Tim Caswell, who's here somewhere in the audience. Uh, hey, Tim. Um, and Tim invented the whole idea of uh, connect-based middleware. And uh, he's, he's going to give a talk tomorrow about sort of alternatives there and things that may actually uh, may be better than this. I should point out, though, that I did try using streams at this point. And uh, I had two duplex streams, uh, and I had four transform streams. To, uh, these are the streams, too, that you'll find in Node.js today. And uh, doing that proved to be 10 times slower than using connect-based middleware. Um, it was just not possible to use it. So if I'm trying to do this for speed, which I definitely am, I've got to use the fastest approach. And it also happens to be the approach that everybody knows already. So that's why we're going for connect-based middleware here. Um, one of the coolest parts of socket stream in the past, and one of the best ideas, I think, that is, is being brought forward to Prism is that it's completely transport agnostic. You've heard just now about all the various problems of using different types of uh, web sockets and mobile connections and things like that. And these projects, SockJS and Engine.io, are the best projects that actually um, provide fallbacks for these problems. So the, the long polling fallbacks and different flash-based fallbacks, there's a mixture that you can choose from. But the really cool thing about Prism is that you don't even have to invest all your effort and all your time in picking one of those because you can easily switch between them with just changing one line of code. So that's really cool because you can go from native web sockets uh, and then realize actually, you know, um, there's a, we, our audience don't all have native web sockets and then you can try these two others and there'll be more transports that are added in the, in the future. Now, it would have been all too easy to do this in a way which was only specific to Prism, and that you'd have to use the Prism server to actually be able to use this. But trying to sort of take this uh, methodology right and, and seeing it through to the end, I thought, how can we make transports know nothing about the server that is using them? And how can we give value to people who want to do the same thing and switch between transports without having to necessarily commit themselves to using the Prism server or the, the whole socket stream stack. So um, over the weekend, I purchased this new repository called Real-Time Transport. And in there, it sets out what the problem is, and it gives links to three transports, uh, a native web socket, the SockJS, and Engine.io that use this methodology. And the really cool thing is that even if you want to do nothing else today but switch between transports on your own app, you can now use these to do that. So by now, you may be thinking, well, this is sound pretty good. But at the end of the day, I'm a developer, and I want to write code that's going to run in a real-time environment. So how do I actually do that? What does the Prism server actually do? So it's worth taking a look at some of the ways that real-time uh, real um, servers and um, modules and so do this at the moment. In the case of Socket.io, Socket.io has built-in functionality. It has two building blocks, essentially, RPC and PubSub. And a lot of solutions that you do in Socket.io um, are, uh, are, are made by combining these two things together. So you can get things like um, Angular JS uh, live update models, and they're separate NPM packages which you put on top of Socket.io. But unfortunately, Socket.io has never been built in a way so that it can be modularly extended with different functionality for models and things like that. So it kind of does exist, but there's not a huge uptake of this at the moment. 
On the other hand, of course, the most popular thing at the moment is Meteor. And Meteor has even more core functionality. It has RPC, PubSub models, and it also has um, this thing called MiniMongo, which runs in the client. Um, so there's a lot, lots of, lot more module, uh, lot more functionality by default. Um, Meteor is also extendable. Um, you can change that. Uh, you can extend it using uh, special packages. And it was designed that way from the start, which is a really good thing. But the big problem with Meteor is that the packages that you extend it with are only ever usable on Meteor. You can't then take that package and use it on a different system. It's completely incompatible with the rest of the Node uh, apps which are out there. So I was thinking, how do we do this differently? How can we, um, how can we provide more features, but also make sure that the code that you're writing isn't specific just to this server. So in Prism, the and hence Socket Stream, which we'll use it, um, it has uh, no built-in functionality by default. It doesn't tell you that this is the way to do RPC or this is the way to do PubSub. But instead, all the effort has gone into making a modular system that you can use to extend the server with. And the modular system is called Real-Time Services. And this has its own repository now, which you can go to and read more about this concept. And it's a new way to write code that you can reuse, not just in this server, but other servers in the future. Because that is what you're going to be spending most of your time doing, writing code um, and investing your team's effort into building code. And what you don't want to be doing is buying into a really proprietary stack that belongs to one vendor. Because, that may, because you're not able to take that away and use it anywhere else. So some of the highlights of real-time services are um, that you can write client and server code in exactly the same way. It's the same API. And you have control over every byte that goes over the wire. So many real-time solutions assume that you want to use JSON. But that's not always the case. You know, if you're doing a real-time game, you want the maximum speed and the minimal bandwidth. And for that, you want to be able to send the smallest possible messages over the wire. And real-time services allow you to have that control. Um, you're also able to return custom APIs. You're able to write an API which is accessible through an object on the client and then also on the server. Now, some things will have APIs on the clients. For example, if you're sending a message from the client to the server, then you'll, you'll offer a client API to do that. But if you're publish, publishing a message from the server to the um, client, then there'll be an API on the server to do that, which you call from your other code. And it uses this idea of like a shared object, um, which, is, which is definitely not a global thing, I should say. It's just one object which, has, uh, which you can chain APIs onto. And this is an idea that's been around for a while now in SocketStream. It works really well. The best thing about real-time services is that you can use them in your own apps, we, with or without any of the other stuff I'm showing you today. It has its own module. Um, and they're, they're written in a way where each service will be easy to test. And when it's all finished, the code that you write on the the service will also be testable. So you've got the service itself, which you need to write tests for. But then all these de you know, developers who are making real-time models and things like that, they also want to be able to test their code. So there's two layers of testing. We need to get both right. Best thing of all is that they're super simple to write. And there's so many ways that these, this could have been done. I did explore making them streams. I did explore making them uh, depend on different modules and so on. But in the end, I thought, what's the simplest it can possibly be? And the answer is a pure JavaScript object. And it looks like that. And basically, a real-time service is just an object with a client and a server um, property. And the code that you write for the client and the server looks exactly the same. All the API is exactly the same. Cool. OK, so that's, I've got a few minutes where I just want to show you some code now. Um, so it, most of you have hopefully be OK with some JavaScript code. Um, let's just have a look. I may mean, have to uh, change my display, as usual. It's been a while since I did this one. Um, got it? Oh, really? <laughs> I've never done that before. <laughs> Let me do that. Cool, OK. Um, so 
Let's have a look. Okay, can we see some code? Okay, so so this is um, Socket Stream 04, which is which is a work in progress. Let's say, um, and actually, the Socket Stream framework, when once this is all finished and it's already about 80% of the way there, will contain pretty much no code at all. It's just going to be glue code around these different modules. Um, this is a Prism library here. Uh, it's on GitHub here. And you can see, basically, if I go down here, that this is how you start a server. It's really simple. And this is me adding a real-time service, which I have called RPC here. Now, you, the cool thing is that you can take these modules and you can call them any name that you want. And the name that you choose changes the, how you access the API, but it also changes the directory where any of those files are stored. So each service has its own directory. So let me start by just showing you how I've, what Socket Stream looks like at the moment now. This has been integrated. Um, so this is it booting up. This is the new version. Uh, and this is using the Prism server. So I can just go to uh, my local host now. A lot of you have seen this demo lots of times. Um, and in the background, what's happening is it's going through the Prism server. And I've passed a logger to the server, which gives you this pretty output here. By default, the server itself is completely silent. So you'll need to pass your own logger in there. Remember, this is a solution for people who've already got existing tech stacks and are quite happy to integrate things. If this is all sounding very familiar, unfamiliar to you, then the socket stream, the framework, will give you all of this uh, straight away, and it will all be integrated, and it will just work basically out of the uh, straight away. So the code that does this in socket stream um, is inside this directory called that example app, and this is my app here. Uh, and because they start on different servers now, the asset server and the and the um, real-time server are on different ports. In fact, they're different processes. Um, we're sharing this config file. So what you saw there was an app that was running on Nginio. And uh, if I sort of query in here, I can get hold of that API. I think I, I may have called it app now. I can't remember. No, it's, here we go. I can get hold of the API that's returned from the Prism server. And you can see that I've got three different things I can call, pub, sub, RPC, and square. These are my three different services. And they, uh, they are here, pub, sub, RPC, and square. Now, square just squares a number. And if I just put that in there, you can see the entire service all on one screen. That does that. And the really cool thing here is that real-time services help you along by providing very, very basic low-level building blocks. So I don't have to handle callbacks in my code, because all I need to do is enable callbacks here and say, I want to use callbacks. And it will take care of assigning the callback stack for you. So it's really, really simple. And the reason I'm building this and spending so much time getting this bit right is because I know there are people out there who've already taken the socket stream code before and made real-time model solutions. And now this is going to be like 10 times easier to do that. So I expect that there will be a lot of, uh, I mean, I already know this because people have been watching this code actually on GitHub without me announcing it and started working on it already. Um, but there will be a lot of solutions around you know, Angular, real-time models, backbone models, all sorts of things. There'll be a whole ecosystem. And SocketStream will pick the best ones out and integrate those into the framework by default. So this is my Square server. And I can invoke this here. Um, I think it's just there. I can invoke it by giving it a number. And it just squares it and it returns it. And that's going over here. So you see there. I'll just do that again. Um, you can see. And this logging is actually built into the service as well, because I'm saying server.log. And then the answer is here. But the really cool thing is uh, I'm using Nginio here. And I'm just going to connect to this now from a remote server. Uh, it's this one here, I think. Um, so node. I think this is my REPL. So I'm connecting to the server from a remote process. This could be on a different machine. And it's calling the server, and it's discovering the services that are on this server. So you basically say to the server, tell me what you've got. And it sends back the client API through the WebSocket. 
So now I've got exactly the same commands, exactly the same client. It's actually the same code, so it works in exactly the same way. And now I can go api.square and pass a, oh, I don't want to pass that, um, pass a value, and it's calling the same code. Okay. And the cool thing is, because these two are actually linked together and it's the same server, I can even now um, use an RPC command if I remember how to do this. Send message to invoke It's hard to actually type at the same time. Oh dear, is that spell right? I think so. Um, to actually invoke this over the same WebSocket. So I'll just move these around. There we go. So it's a different way of connecting to the same server, and it's all going through the same system, all through the same tech stack. OK, so I think I have two minutes just to conclude. Um, so, so, that's, so that's basically what SocketStream is going to look like. It's going to have different components, all of them usable on their own. The Prism server is already on GitHub now. There's an example of how you can use it with your own Express apps today without any of the other stuff that I've shown you. And uh, if I just put back into uh, here. So, SocketStream04 is going to be an opinionated real-time framework. Because we now have more choice, and because you now have the ability to change more things very easily, it actually means we can be more opinionated than ever about what we think is the best way of getting up and getting new people to start off being instantly productive. Prism is a real-time component of SocketStream, and as of today, that's now available on GitHub. Real-time transports allow you to switch between everything with just one line of code. You probably saw my code, I had three things. Um, if I, I can switch between those at any time, I, don't, I no longer have to write my application code against my transport layer. And real-time services, pub sub, presence, real-time models, gaming, all sorts of things will come in the future, and they're now fully reusable on NPM in a standard way, nothing vendor-specific whatsoever. Thank you very much.